We're gonna start our first session today with the economic picture. How do we emerge from this health pandemic and what's the future of work in the wake of it? Our first presenter is Abigail Wozniak. Abigail is an economist and the director of an Opportunity and Inclusive, Inclusive Growth Institute at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And she's also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor in Bonn, Germany. Abigail, please turn on your mic and share your screen and you're ready to go. Thank you so much, Rob. And also for your opening words, which I thought were really fitting um, and help us understand where we are today. So I want to spend the time that I have doing two things um, and, and a half thing, which is uh, step zero to remind you of the disclaimer at the bottom of your screen. I'm speaking for myself as a researcher and not for the Federal Reserve System. So that's my half thing out of the way. The two things I wanna to do today um, are to share with you information about a study called the COVID Impact Survey, which is ongoing um, so that you understand what this contains and can make use of these data if they could be helpful to you. And then I'm gonna, uh, the second thing I'll be doing is explaining what the COVID Impact Survey can tell us about how employer screening might function in a widespread way if that gets adopted over the ongoing course of the pandemic. The COVID Impact Survey is a project that I've been a co-PI on for the last two months at this point. We designed the survey early on in the pandemic in order to provide a broad spectrum view to policymakers of what is happening on the ground um, in their jurisdictions. And the aspirations of the COVID Impact Survey are really twofold. The first is to provide, as I mentioned, a broad spectrum view on what is happening to respondents. And to that end, the COVID Impact Survey has three modules to it. Um, a module surveying on physical health and COVID symptoms, a module on mental and social health, and a module on economic and financial security. That third module looks the most like what um, economists like myself typically survey on. But in developing the COVID impact survey, we felt it was important to have a handle on those other two components as well to really give us a full picture of who is being impacted by this virus, both directly and indirectly. What is their health status and their daily experience of the restrictions um, and the health impacts that they might be seeing? And then what are the other impacts that they're experiencing in a broad range of areas that contribute to overall well-being? We are grateful for a considerable amount of external support. So this has really been um, a multi-entity effort. And it has helped us to achieve really the second goal of the COVID Impact Survey, which is to bring that broad lens to geographically and other um, community level specific entities. So we really need to have enough information in this survey and contact enough people in order to be able to provide a picture of what is happening um, at a local level, because that is the decision, the level at which these kind of opening and closing decisions are made. So we've been able, at least in a prototype format, to achieve that for 10 states and eight cities. Um, you can see those listed at the bottom of your screen. We also are able to do this for uh, various uh, populations divided on race, ethnic, and other identity lines um, for folks throughout the US. So we really want to have that lens on communities not just a picture of the nation as a whole. And communities can be defined geographically or by other population characteristics. We hope to make a number of contributions with this survey. I won't be able to tell you about all of them today. I'm gonna to be focusing on that second one, which really involves the intersection of some of these survey areas and how they fit into what the workplace might look like going forward through the remainder of the pandemic. So I'm gonna focus on some components of the COVID impact survey that let me approximate what a widespread screening policy might look like were we to adopt that as we go forward in the pandemic. I'm gonna be telling you a bit about um, what screening in particular on fever symptoms looks like in these data. You can see from the list in front of you that I'm actually able to approximate in the COVID impact survey um, two different types of screenings that employers might adopt widely. The first is temperature screening with thermometers. So about half of our sample is able to take their own temperature and report that. So I can approximate what that might look like if employers were to screen at the door of their businesses. Then we have many questions on self-reported symptoms. And so that lets me approximate a couple of different types of screening 
apps that might be deployed by companies or other types of entities in which individuals self-report the symptoms that they're experiencing. I'm gonna be focusing on self-reported temperature screens. So these are short items, little mini surveys within the survey that ask folks if they've been experiencing any fever temperatures in the last several days. I have highlighted in orange the ones I'm gonna be showing you just a little bit about. There's an ability in the COVID impact survey to screen on other types of um, symptoms that you might want to use like COVID symptoms themselves. So what I wanna show you is two things about how these screens I think are going to shake out. The first is um, to draw your attention to really the far right column here. This is just the average share of respondents in our survey who are in the labor force. So I've respond, um, restricted this to folks who are already potentially going to work. The share of them who would be flagged by these various screens that I can approximate in the COVID impact survey. And the ones I highlighted in orange again are those temperature screens. You can see that if we're screening on temperature using a thermometer, and I set this at a 99 degree threshold, we are potentially going to screen out on a daily basis about 4% of the workforce. That's very similar to a self-reported to um, item scale with those three measures of fever symptoms. If you report two or more of those, um, you would screen out about 3% of the workforce. If we go to any fever symptoms, the number goes up dramatically. 12% of the workforce reporting a fever symptom at a point in time. I'm going to put in a box and put it to the side the question of how workers are going to respond to these. I'm going to come back to that in the policy conversation in a minute and happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But if employees respond to these self-reported checks or these temperature screens the way they do on our survey, we are talking about potentially screening out large numbers of folks um, on a daily basis. That's not to say it's inappropriate, it's to say we need to be prepared for that type of a reality if we are going to try to keep workers safe and contain the spread of this disease. The second thing I want you to take away about these screens is that they don't actually all pick up the same workers. So what I'm showing you here is just a table of correlations between these various different measures that I can put together in the COVID impact survey. And what you can see is that by and large, the correlations are far below one. Um, and in the cases where they seem to get closer to one, it's usually because one set of symptoms is a subset of another set on a longer index. So potentially the type of screen and the precise screen that employers adopt is going to be important for who they screen out. So I wanna tell you um, just the takeaways from this very early analysis on these questions in the COVID impact survey. I think we're looking at potentially screening out uh, what to me are not small numbers of workers on a daily basis. At a minimum, three to 4% of folks will need to stay home and see how their symptoms evolve. Uh, it will matter which screen you use. And I have preliminary evidence that we're still working on that it doesn't look like workers are already doing um, this kind of self-quarantine themselves. So I don't see strong evidence that workers with these mild symptoms that they report are already staying home themselves to see how symptoms evolve. So I think that One suggests minute. importance for um, policy that's going to support this. So I want to conclude with uh, what I think are really important policy takeaways from the, um, the statistics that we've been able to uh, pull out so far on this question. First, we're going to need adequate support to encourage those who have symptoms to stay home. We already have some of these um, protections in place under CARES, but they need to be clear to people, they need to be enforced, and they need to be extended. Um, it needs to be clear that this includes those in affected households. Um, and this support is so important because this is what's going to guarantee the truth in those screenings. If going to work and getting your paycheck is contingent on how you answer a workplace symptom screen, potentially um, there will not be full transparency and truth in reporting on the part of employees. So those protections have to be in place to guarantee um, honest response to that. We also need incentives for individuals to get tested. Employers might decide to do this themselves directly, but potentially they could incentivize workers to use public testing. Um, and we might even think of programs that provide those incentives directly from the government to citizens to encourage folks who are having some symptoms to really get tested. And then finally, I didn't get to talk about this, but um, we have this information in the COVID impact survey. Folks who already have underlying um, risk factors that would make their COVID infection more serious potentially need to be supported to um, be away from the workforce 
for the course of the pandemic that doesn't currently exist, they're not currently necessarily withdrawing from the workforce on their own. And so thinking about how to support those folks, keep them from developing the worst cases is important as well. I'll just conclude with the line that I, I think is important from this survey. There's always a lot of worry about the asymptomatic folks who are spreading this disease um, unbeknownst to others. But what I think the COVID impact survey is telling us is that we need to pay a lot of attention to the symptomatics and use the information that they have um, to design policy and help them self-select and keep folks safe by making good decisions themselves. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Abigail. As you can see, um, starting the economy is not just a matter of flipping a switch and returning to work. There are important challenges to face in uh, reactivating the workforce and different companies, places of labor while still containing the virus. Um, I'd like now to introduce our second speaker, Lisa Kahn. Lisa is a professor of economics at the University of Rochester and her research focuses on labor economics. Her most recent work asks whether the Great Recession accelerated technological change and exacerbated polarization in the United States. Lisa, you can take it away now and please share your video and turn your microphone on. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, thank you very much for, for including me. Uh, and again, thank you for the, for the words at the beginning. I think it's very important to keep in mind the national situation beyond just the COVID crisis. Um, but what I want to talk to you about today is some ongoing work uh, that I'm drawing from a joint with Eliza Forsyth, Fabian Langa, and David Wixer. And we're interested in understanding how the labor market has evolved during the time of COVID. Now, of course, we all know there has been this uh, broad-based collapse. So for example, the red line is showing you the trend in 2020 by week uh, for initial unemployment insurance claims where we see this massive spike uh, starting in the beginning of March. And by now, new unemployment insurance claims have, have totaled uh, 40 million people. And so we know that there's been this unprecedented nationwide collapse in the economy. But what we don't know is a lot of detail around that. And so today, what I'm going to talk about is some analysis that we've been doing um, with job vacancy postings collected by a company called Burning Glass Technologies. And what Burning Glass Technologies does is it uses uh, machine learning and a range of uh, AI techniques as well to scrape job ads that are posted to online sources. So for example, monster.com, careerbuilder.com, individual employer websites, and they code up a range of detail about, about these jobs. Uh, and the breadth of sites that they scrape, over 40,000 different sites, leads them to believe they have data on the near universe of jobs that are posted to an online source. And so importantly, this gives us um, a great deal of detail about labor demand. And it's worth noting that job vacancy postings are inherently a forward-looking measure. So they can tell us how employers foresee um, the need to contract when the COVID crisis hit and how employers are thinking about the need to hire as the COVID crisis, crisis alleviates. And the other useful thing about the burning glass data is that, is that they've been around for a while now, so they've been validated. So um, Rob mentioned some early work that I did on burning glass data, trying to understand how, and showing actually that in the Great Recession, firms accelerated the adoption of technologies that could replace certain swaths of their workforce. And that showed up in the burning glass data by firms all of a sudden after the Great Recession, asking for people who had computer skills and analytical skills and that combined with other data sources on capital inputs and declines in employment suggests that indeed employers took the opportunity of the Great Recession to restructure. And I think Eric is going to talk about what that means for the COVID crisis next. But what we learn from the burning glass data for the current COVID crisis, you can see the blue line is showing you the trend in vacancy postings that saw a 40% collapse over the same time period as UI claims spiked. Um, and potentially a little bit of a recovery going. These data go up to the minute, um, they go up to Saturday. I was working on incorporating them this morning. So they are a real-time measure. And importantly, they give us a great deal of detail about the economy. So one question that we're particularly interested in is how did state shutdown policies and state stay-at-home orders impact the economy? Well, one way to understand that is in this graph, we're showing you the time series for different groups of states. 
The solid darkest line is showing you the states that issued stay at home orders the earliest. That's California, New York, Washington, and some others. The dashed light line is showing you states that never had a statewide stay at home policy. And the other lines are, are time somewhere in between. Now, the first order fact from this figure is a broad-based collapse across all state groups that was roughly aligned to a synchronous, roughly at the same time period. There are some small differences, such, for example, the states that closed the earliest, they do look like they had a steeper collapse. And the states that didn't close at all, they look like they had a shallower collapse. But the broad picture here is that job vacancies collapsed across the board, regardless of the timing of state stay-at-home policies and whether they have these policies. We can also look across industries. And so this graph is showing you as a ratio relative to the beginning of the year, what the number of postings looks like for different types of industries. The blue solid line is representing essential retail. So that's your grocery stores uh, and, and, and gas stations and things like that. This group actually saw no decline in vacancy postings. In fact, they have these big spikes, which likely represent employers scrambling to get workers to sell you your toilet paper and your food and your needs um, over the crisis. Uh, but this group is largely distinct. Another group that didn't take as big a hit uh, was, was the nursing occupation. So, but besides these frontline jobs, every other sector took a hit. This graph shows you um, uh, some customer facing sectors that took among the biggest hits. So the blue dash line are non-essential retail, things like your clothing stores. The red line are, are restaurants and hotels. And the orange line is personal care, for example, your barbers and your tattoo parlors. Um, and these all customer facing roles took the biggest hit, even though, for instance, um, food and accommodation are, are generally essential industries. The green lines are also showing you other, other groups. So other essential industries, the solid green line, and other non-essential industries, the dash green line. And these had a fairly similar experience. So in terms of a uh, collapse. So what have we learned so far? Um, job vacancy posting saw a broad based collapse that was similar to the most part to a first order approximation across states that had these stay at home policies early versus late versus not at all. What I didn't show you is that we also see a broad-based collapse across occupations, whether or not that occupation is deemed to be able to work from home. So regardless of work conditions, whether you're capable of leaving your house to, to, to work or whether you can do your work at home, we saw a big collapse. And then the previous figure showed you, we saw a big collapse across essential and non-essential industries, while frontline jobs such as retail, essential retail and nursing were somewhat protected, Customer facing jobs such as non essential retail and personal care took the biggest hit, but all sectors, for the most part, took a big hit. And this suggests to us that the damage to the economy is not solely caused by the stay at home orders, uh, it's just too broad based. And so, therefore, it's unlikely to be undone simply by lifting these stay at home orders. And so, the last thing that I'm going to show you is an early look at what's been happening since the economy has been opening. So here you see uh, vacancy postings by three state groups. The dash line are again, the states that never closed. The um, uh, dark line are states that opened by May 16th. And the lighter line are states that either have not opened yet or have only opened most recently. And here for the most part, again, we see a very similar trend across all state groups with maybe a slight rebound uh, for, the, for the earliest states. One minute. Thanks. And then what I, we can also do is break this down into a some of those uh, hardest hit sectors, the non-essential retail in the top left, restaurants in the top right, personal care in the bottom left, other non-essential jobs in the bottom right. For the most part, we do see some interesting rebounds overall here. So non-essential retail has made quite a rebound in recent weeks and as have restaurants. And these rebounds are really fairly similar across state groups, and, you, and you'd have to squint quite a bit to see a difference, and this may be a little too small for you to squint, but trust me, uh, there's really not been that much of a difference yet, even though there has been some rebound. So what does this all mean? Yes, we are seeing a little bit of a rebound, especially in non-essential retail, which took one of the biggest hits. 
And that, by the way, suggests we're going to be seeing extraordinary worker reallocation in the labor market going forward because non-essential retail actually did have among the biggest layoffs at the beginning of the crisis. And now they're doing a lot of the rebound in hiring. Um, but the early evidence on reopenings confirms uh, that our earlier inclination that you can't just flip a switch to the, get the economy back on track because it wasn't that switch of stay at home orders that caused the shortfall in the first place. Recovery is going to take basically an increase in aggregate demand that needs to come from getting the virus under control and improvements in consumer confidence and sentiment so that they think they can afford to spend money on goods and other aspects like restoration of, of supply chains uh, and things like that. And moving forward, that's what uh, we intend to track. And we're also very interested in moving forward in how these response and vacancy postings interacts with what we've also seen is an unprecedented, decl unprecedented decline in worker search effort at the same time as there's more workers unemployed than ever. And historically, those things usually track each other. So it's very interesting that they haven't. Um, but these data allow us um, a detailed picture in real time that we will continue to hopefully track uh, the, the COVID crisis. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, well, once again, another presentation that underscores that restarting the economy is not, the, not a matter of flipping a switch um, simply lifting shelter in place orders that there are just many complicated issues to work through in order to rebuild consumer confidence and social trust in the safety of the workplace. Um, we're going to wrap up our economic session with a presentation from Eric Binjolfsson. Uh, Eric is a senior fellow at HAI and he's going to join us um, here at Stanford in a full-time capacity this summer. Um, for these uh, remaining months until then, he's currently on the faculty at MIT, where he directs the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, and his work focuses on the effects of information technologies on business strategy, productivity, and performance. Eric, uh, you can go ahead and share your screen, um, turn on your microphone, and start your presentation. Thanks, Rob and Russ. Thank you so much for organizing this. I'm, I'm very excited to be coming to Stanford exactly because of the kinds of events like this that you've organized and, and the privilege to uh, be able to, to share the discussion with Abby and Lisa. And, and I'm very much looking forward also to uh, all the participants and the questions and comments uh, people may have. As you noted, uh, you know, we're in the midst of an of a unprecedented tragedy, both in health and the economy. Um, and we've heard some of the, the effects of that already. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what might come after that. Um, economists have a term called hysteresis, which basically means that sometimes when you change things, they don't go back to the way they were before, uh, even when the conditions return. And I think that's going to be very much the case with, with this crisis. Um, people like us are learning about the power of remote work. Uh, companies are aggressively trying to figure out how to automate some of their operations, how to use machine learning and other technologies to have people uh, have the work face place continue to function with fewer human workers. And uh, some of those changes, I think, are going to be permanent and lasting. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Let me, um, let me share my slides here and, and show you what I have in mind. So um, I'll talk in particular about those two topics that I just mentioned, uh, how COVID is affecting AI, machine learning, and also remote work. And, and let me start with a, a, a quote that I came across from a, a, a revolutionary uh, uh, about a century ago. He said that there are decades where nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And I think these past few weeks are an example of those kinds of uh, uh, time periods. There's been just a, a huge acceleration in obviously remote work and also machine learning, and, and, and over the weekend, maybe some social change as well. Um, to, to zoom in first on some of what's happened with technology, uh, we've seen a huge increase in the adoption of different technologies. Lisa touched on this a little bit as well as how these crises can accelerate technology adoption. One example is TensorFlow, the tool that is Google developed for um, doing machine learning has become dramatically more popular, 10 million downloads just in the past month. Um, and a little later, I'll show you some of the work that we've been doing using that exact tool. Um, but at the same time, machine learning is very far from artificial general intelligence. It can't do everything. There are just some things that it does very well and some things not so well. 
So a natural question is what parts of the economy are going to be most affected by the adoption of these technologies about machine learning in particular, and which parts will be relatively less affected. And working with uh, Tom Mitchell, Daniel Rock, and others, we've written a series of papers to try to identify the set of tasks that are most suitable for machine learning. And you can read more detail about them in the papers, but let me briefly say that what we've done is we've applied this rubric to 950 occupations or 18,000 occupation-specific tasks to understand which ones are more suitable and which ones are less suitable. And uh, there's some patterns that emerge. Uh, for instance, we can see that if you look at all the occupations and you array them on the horizontal axis here by what the average wage is in that occupation from the lowest paid ones on the left to the higher paid ones on the right, um, you see a pattern where the more machine learning applications are available in the lower paid app uh, jobs on average and less so on the higher paid jobs. So, so for instance, most of us have probably experienced the uh, automated cashiers that can recognize a, a cucumber or a banana or a tomato um, much better than they could have a few years ago and beginning to automate parts of that process. But there's some high paid jobs uh, like airline pilot that are also being increasingly affected by these technologies. Uh, no, no occupation is immune. Um, even economists are on the list there, although a little less subject than, than uh, some of the other occupations according to the analysis. You can also group it by industry. And you see that, again, some industries are much more affected than others. Education services, not as much, but manufacturing, retailing, transportation, especially accommodation and food services, have a lot of tasks that are suitable for machine learning. Um, different areas of the country are going to be affected very differently. Um, the kinds of work that people do in, in Wyoming are very different than what they do in Manhattan um, or Miami. And we see that shows up in our analysis as well, that the likelihood that a machine learning system can affect some of those tasks is higher in some parts of the country than other parts of the country. So we'll have some disparate impacts. And then we can zoom in on individual companies. We can use the same tool um, to look at the tasks that are done in individual companies. And here's one bank that we looked at in some depth. And uh, they have a lot of uh, occupations that are affected by machine learning. Uh, the ones near the bottom there, like teller, executive assistant, and personal banker, have a large percentage of their tasks that are suitable for machine learning. The red bar is pretty large. And uh, that means that these activities are likely to change quite a bit over the coming years, even more recently as, as companies are adopting these technologies. Um, and our tool also gives them a way to have a path for what to do next. One option, for instance, for personal bankers is to reinvent the job so that it has more of the skills that aren't subject to machine learning, like leadership, product development, customer relations, and less of the uh, tasks that are, are highly related to machine learning, like credit authorization. So it'd still be a personal banker, but they do very different work. Another option is to uh, find new roles. Um, some of these personal bankers have a lot of skill overlap with uh, business analysts or mortgage loan officers or HR managers, and we can map how similar they are to some of these other nearby occupations. And with a little bit of training, they're in a position to be much less vulnerable to uh, the machine learning revolution. Now, let me also say a few words about um, remote work. We just finished uh, two papers. Here's one of them, um, looking at the US data on how COVID is affecting uh, remote work and work from home. We looked at about 25,000 individuals and had them answer two waves of surveys. And um, what we found was that about half of Americans are now working from home. It's an enormous transition. Um, before COVID, about one sixth were working at home and another third switched to working at home. So that's a big percentage of the workforce. I'm one of those people and I'm sure many of you are as well. After the pandemic, Many of them will go back to working the way they were before, but many others are going to continue to work from home. I talked to one CEO and uh, he pulled his workforce and they were mostly pretty happy with working at home. And he was very happy with the results and the productivity. So he is in the process of renegotiating his leases and plans on having people one, minute. one to two days per week going forward and the rest of the time working at home. And when they do come in, they'll focus much more on interactive activities rather than working in separate offices and cubicles. And I think that's part of this hysteresis I mentioned over earlier, a, a transition that won't lead to us going back to the old ways afterwards. There are 
as you might expect, big differences across states. Uh, the states in the Northeast that were hit hardest by COVID are also the ones that had the biggest switch to working at home. But we also found that one of the good predictors was the share of management and information work activities. Uh, those types of tasks are much easier to do working at home. And finally, uh, Lisa mentioned this uh, data set from Burning Glass Technologies has over 200 million online job postings. Uh, we were analyzing it last night using TensorFlow and we had some, some new results just in time for this. Uh, by looking at it, we could see which kinds of tasks and jobs are most suitable for machine learning. I mean, sorry, most suitable for remote work. So similar to the other one, but now focusing on remote work instead. And you see that jobs like ours in education um, are tend to be uh, more remotable, anything involving management, whereas people doing installation and physical work are less remotable. So let me just summarize by saying that these powerful technologies are already available, whether in machine learning or remote work. They haven't been put to use as much because it takes time for businesses to adapt. But with this shock to the system, companies and individuals are being forced to adapt and learning when they work and when they don't work so well. Um, but thinking ahead, after the pandemic, we're going to have a new economy that has a lot more people doing remote work, a lot more people working offshore as well, and also a lot more people using machine learning in their work. And that's going to be a very different kind of economy. And it makes sense for managers today to think about what kind of skills and workforce they want for that economy of the future. So let me stop there and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Terrific. Um, all right, thanks very much, Eric. So at this point, I'd like to ask all three speakers to turn on their microphones and um, their video and uh, ask Russ uh, to join me as well. And we'll have a short discussion and then get to some questions from the audience in just a few minutes. So a general question for all of you, and we can just hop in as you wish. Um, uh, we heard lots of really interesting data, um, some projections about the economic impact, both of just immediate return to the workforce as well as trends downstream and whatever, whatever the return works, it, works itself out. I'm curious to know a bit more about the disparate impact um, across different either kinds of labor or in particular by race and gender um, that you foresee. So Eric, for example, um, you noted that there's a disproportionate impact of low wage uh, on low wage jobs and some regional differences as well. Um, Abby, I'm interested in whether or not you see anything similar happening with respect to um, um, the, the, the kind of temperature testing regimes that are going to be necessary to bring people back. Um, and Lisa, same for you with respect to um, the kinds of the kinds of questions about um, how it is that job vacancies are likely to tick up or, or, or remain flat. Uh, so um, insofar as you have information or guesses, even on the basis of the data you've seen on disparate impact on race and gender, can you speak to that with respect to your different presentations? And um, Abby, if you want to start first, just because you went first, please go ahead. Sure, I'm happy to start. So I will just underscore that, um, you know, as, as I think was clear from our motivation in, in starting the COVID impact survey, looking for disparate impacts was a was a major motivation as well. And we wanted to be able to look at those by geography. We also wanted to be able to look at those by um, demographics and other affiliations. I think that what we found there is potentially not terribly surprising, but it is quite concerning. So um, consistent with some different approaches, we do find more significant negative impacts on economic security for non-white individuals. Um, we find particularly large declines in employment and hours for Hispanic respondents, um, also to some extent for Asians. At the time of our data collection, we were finding um, nationally that black workers and white workers had experienced about similar declines. I'm not sure that is going to hold as the pandemic goes on. We are gonna be watching that closely. Um, and families with children have been experiencing steeper employment declines as well. And again, um, this extends to a number of the other well-being indicators that we can also track. So, um, so that's concerning. This is a, a widespread cut to well-being that is not being evenly shared. Everyone is experiencing negative changes, um, but folks who are older and folks who were higher earning to begin with um, are much more insulated. We also do see differences in these impacts across space. Um, like Lisa found, these are not well explained by the policies that places have adopted. They're also not well explained by the behaviors that people have adopted. So our survey asks folks what they themselves are doing, you know, none of which are really currently required. 
um, at least again at the time of the survey, everybody was adopting lots of different behaviors from what they had in the past. And that did not differ significantly across space. So it doesn't account for these different impacts. Um, I think what's happening is that some places are gonna experience bigger negative changes. It's because of the populations that live there. And that suggests it's important for policy to target families and households that we know are the hardest hit. As far as disparities in how screening will work, um, that's something that I'm looking into as well. The temperature screens that I'm able to approximate do not seem to be differentially uh, flagging individuals on observable demographics, except possibly women um, are flagged more often for a temperature screen. That may be something that um, is a regularity. We need to look into that more. When you think about the other measures though, um, like self-reported headache, self-reported fatigue or cough, those do pick up um, individuals who are non-white in background or have other demographic differences more often that may be due to other underlying health conditions. And so we need to understand more about whether some of these self-reported symptom checkers might um, pick up different types of folks differentially and whether that's accurate. Let me ask one quick follow-up question on that, Abby. I think you mentioned in your presentation that on these self-reports on the temperature screens, um, as a kind of precondition for actually returning to the to the workforce. Um, there's a, a problem of incentives. If you don't have your wage guaranteed, um, there's a, you know, a, a misaligned incentive for honest reporting. So what do we know, if anything, about um, the incidence of wage guarantees if you report that you have a temperature and therefore shouldn't report to the workforce and, and disparate impact in that respect? So the CARES Act right now is designed to guarantee paid leave for individuals who believe that they may have COVID in order to take time off to get that investigated. Um, it is also designed to provide paid leave for folks who are caring for someone with COVID. So in that sense, it would expand to the household. In my view, this needs to be really clear and really strong because I don't see a lot of evidence in the data that folks are staying home if they are ill. Um, and the kind of flip side is when folks report more symptoms, they report separating from their employer. So it's unclear why they are doing that, but the intention of the CARES Act is for them to remain with their employer but stay home. And I'm not, that's not what I'm seeing really in the data yet. So Something is maybe not getting communicated. Now, there are other policy pieces that could be interacting with this. The UI top up might affect employer and employee behavior in this context that might go away. Um, but I think that we're not seeing this piece of the act work the way we think it should be working just yet. And so that we need to kind of track that. Um, I kind of am of the opinion that it is going to require a little bit more of a carrot even than the CARES Act has. Um, I think people need to be incentivized to watch this carefully. Um, you know, I'll say even myself, I, I kind of get halfway out the door to go to something and then I think, oh no, do I have a sore throat? You know, and maybe I should pay attention to that because my instinct is to not pay attention to that. It's to kind of barrel ahead until I feel good and sick. And, um, and I'm sure a lot of people are the same way. So I think, you know, beyond guaranteeing paid leave, we need to actually incentivize folks to carefully monitor themselves and, and look for that information. Should I be quarantining? Should I take a day off just to be careful and see what happens? And that's a piece that is not in the policy right now. Right. We'll be talking in the next session about some different testing and tracing um, policy regimes, but let me um, um, invite Lisa and Eric into the conversation about disparate impact uh, in any respect. Um, Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, sure. I'll just say a couple of things. I think Abby covered a, a lot of that. Um, the uh, a couple of things. So one is that the frontline workers, the workers whose whose health is is most at risk, uh, research shows that the, they're more likely to be minorities. Um, and some of the jobs that we think of, like nursing and cashiers, are are more likely to be female. So there's certainly going to be a disparate impact on on the health effects there, and on the economic effects. Um, although employers have contracted across the board whether or not they're posting for a job that typically somebody can perform at home or somebody needs to be in person, that's been contracted across the board. But from the data that we do have, it looks like layoffs have spiked higher in jobs 
that can't be performed from home. And I think Eric can speak to this, but that's more likely, or sorry, yes, that can't be performed at home. And so that's more likely to be, the layoffs are more likely to be for the less educated and so already the ones in the, in the worst position. And so combining that layoff spike with what we're seeing on the job vacancy side means they're going to, the lower income people who already are suffering more, they're going to have to last for this longer period in unemployment. Um, and so there's probably going to be a disparate impact there as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just summarizing here in my own head and listening to you all, uh, commonplace is to say that the pandemic has revealed a whole bunch of background inequality in American society, but it also sounds like it's going to exacerbate um, um, these inequalities on a number of dimensions as well. Uh, Eric, over, over to you. Yeah, well, first let me say it, it could exacerbate them, but I don't think there's any inevitability. And I think one of the reasons that you guys are organizing this is right. depending on the actions that we take, um, there's a lot of different possible futures that we can have. Uh, that said, to underscore what, what you said, the, the current effects um, we did see, just to, to, to reiterate both on what I, I briefly showed on both machine learning and remote work, on machine learning, there was a, a, a noticeable gradient um, between uh, higher paid versus lower paid jobs, uh, the, the lower paid jobs having more tasks that were suitable for machine uh, learning. Um, we also saw some significant geographic differences uh, as well. Um, and on remote work, um, I did it quickly, but the kinds of occupations and tasks that were affected were also quite different. Um, not surprisingly, information workers like all of us on this panel um, were less likely to be affected. And, and uh, if I have to confess, I think in some ways I've been more productive the past uh, couple of months um, at home. But for most people or for a lot of people, that's not been the case. Um, we saw that, that jobs that involve, you know, many jobs do involve physically interacting with, uh, with the things that they're working with. And they just is, they can't do that remotely. So they've been, uh, have a much higher likelihood of being unemployed in our survey and much less likely of working home. And the last thing I'll say is, is a little anecdotal, but it's a, it's a blind spot that I had. Um, Larry Katz, the editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics, tweeted a, a little while back that the submissions were way up to the top journal in, in economics, or one of the top journal. And, uh, and I commented, yeah, I found that I was more productive working at home as well. And this seems to you know, work pretty well. And I was quickly barraged by a bunch of people who had kids at home. And they said, actually, not so much. It's, it's actually not necessarily easier to work at home if you have kids at home. So it, it makes a big difference. Um, and, I, and the data suggests it's, it's early, but it suggests that women have been disproportionately affected by that as opposed to men. So there are, there are a number of things that are emerging now that, that um, I and I think others had some blind spots about, but the data are, are coming in. All right, well, we're going to move to audience questions in just a little bit, but uh, I want to get my co-host, Russ Altman, into the conversation here. Yeah, thanks. These were great talks. And, and I have a couple of follow-ups. Uh, first, for Eric, on this issue of disparities, uh, and I, by the way, I love that quote about decades and weeks, and I can't reproduce it, but it's a great quote. Um, a lot has happened in a very short time. Uh, uh, we've been talking about this displacement, and I, I've heard you speak about it and others speak about it for several years now, and I'm struck that, uh, just as in that quote, there is now a pressure to retrain and to get the workforce moved in, with an urgency that is much greater. We knew it was coming and there was a lot of discussions about it, but now it's present. Uh, is there data or are there policy moves that we need to consider to take those people whose main skills are all in those red bars that you showed and have them begin yeah. uh, as quickly as possible to take up new types of work? What, what's the options there? Well, you know, I think it's a tragedy. There are literally trillions of dollars worth of, of, it, uh, of smart uh, human capital, to use that term, uh, going out the doors of companies. They're being laid off without a lot of attention to what's going to be needed on the other side of this. And some of it's being irreparably destroyed. Uh, business, small businesses that will never come back and, and, and careers that are going to be permanently changed. I wish people were paying more attention to what's on the other side of it, managers. They need a roadmap, and we're trying to provide that that says, look, um, the economy will come back. The pandemic won't continue forever. And on the other side of it, there's going to be a different kind of an economy. And it's one that I think all of us on, on this panel and probably most of the people listening have seen the outlines of already. You know, we know that machine learning and remote work, these technologies have been available. But the other thing we know from the history of, of technology adoption is that it's not enough to simply bolt technology onto an existing organization. There's a lot of reinvention that has to happen. There's a lot of new skills that need to be developed. Those things take time and most people don't invest the time. And it, that's why it often takes five, 10, even 20 years 
for these general purpose technologies to really change the way the economy works. But because of this crisis, a lot of that has been compressed and people like me are being forced to see that we can run our, our seminars. I've been running a, a lunch seminar every week um, online and it works fabulously well. I don't know why I didn't do it before. Um, three times as many people are participating. The chat room makes it so it's much more egalitarian. Everyone can, can, can uh, chip in in a way they couldn't have before. And I, time after time, I've discovered that there are things, tools I already had that I could have been using, but I just didn't have the uh, push to make them happen. Um, I think that, that businesses are discovering that, and if they have a roadmap to the other side, they will be making the changes, not just for what they can do this week or this month, but where they want to be in the future. And in many cases, that's going to be uh, retraining people who are uh, able to do more of that information work, able to work remotely, able to work with machine learning technologies. So on the other side of it, we can have a, a better economy that, that's more productive and that hopefully also is more inclusive. Yeah, and you make a really important point that there might be a penny wise, pound foolish aspect to letting these people go because their okay. skills are not currently a precise match to what you need, because what you need is going to change. And these are, you know, devoted employees who understand the business and probably. Yeah, there, there's another quote I, I sometimes like to use, which, which is, uh, you know, you want to skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it is right now. And people need to have some visibility into what the economy, what the business is going to look like a, a year from now or two years from now and, and be preparing for that. And, and before, we, before we go to the crowd, yeah, if I could just ask Lisa, Lisa, one question. You said something very intriguing at the very end of your talk about um, there might be a little bit of a disharmony between the postings and the uptake of those postings. Uh, that is, I, and I interpreted that to mean that maybe people are not applying and filling these jobs as quickly. And I just wanted to ask about that because that's intriguing and would be very worrisome. Yeah, well, just actually that relates then to what I what I was going to say is that the the it, this discussion about bringing your workers back or training new workers or what are you going to do it really relates to, to recalls and you know the vast majority of people who who have been put into unemployment say that they are waiting to be recalled by their employers. But if you look at our data that shows actually in the last recent weeks a somewhat of a rebound in in sectors like non essential retail, it doesn't really look it probably isn't the case that they're just recalling their old workers. They're probably taking a new draw. Um, and there are some jobs where they're going to be more likely to bring back their old workers because they have some firm specific human capital wrapped up in them or match quality really matters or something like that. And so that's another area where moving forward, we're going to have to see who's going to be struggling the most because their ties have been severed versus um, employers deciding, actually, no, I have a lot of value in those people. I want to bring them back. Um, but in terms of the sort of disconnect, one thing that we're kind of interested in is, of course, probably the reason why vacancies collapse so much is because firms are worried and they don't want to be hiring. They want to be contracting because they don't know what the future holds. But there's another piece of it, which is they know that nobody's going to be able to accept those jobs right now. They're, people aren't going to be searching for jobs if, if they're stuck at home because of a state policy or because of worry about the virus. And so what we've actually seen, and um, one of my co-authors, uh, co Eliza Forsyth, has been, has been showing a bunch of data on, for example, um, Google Trends in job search. And that is down dramatically, especially relative to the Great Recession, when you saw a lot of people sent to unemployment and then their, their job search spiked because they want a new job now that now they're not employed. And you don't see that right now. In fact, you see the opposite. And so that's a very interesting dynamic. And a small part of this vacancy collapse could actually be employers anticipating that nobody's going to be around to fill these vacancies right now. So I'll just sit tight. Super. Well, I want to move to a couple audience questions. We've had a few questions come in um, that concern uh, a, a different category of vulnerable worker. And um, this question is perhaps initially for Lisa, but I want to invite Abby or Eric to comment on it as well. So what kinds of support do you think will be necessary for the workers in industries, industries who were among the first to close and will almost certainly be the last to reopen? So think about amusement park workers or live music, live sports. Um, a non-trivial part of the labor force, um, one that's quite visible to many people. Uh, and, um, you know, insofar as uh, the, the pandemic orders will not allow gatherings of more than 50 people or 100 people in, a, in an enclosed space in, in any imaginable future. Um, well, what do we do about that particular category of workers? 
Right. Well, I think that there are a couple of things. One is kind of as Eric alluded to, the new, there's going to be a new normal and there's going to be while there's less demand for things like amusement parks and movie theaters, there's going to be more demand for some jobs and services. And what we're seeing is a great deal of reallocation where somebody who is taking ticket stubs at a movie theater can go and work at the grocery store. And they can make that switch pretty easily. And we saw that we have a big spike in demand for grocery store workers. So that type of movement is necessary. And that is only going to continue to be necessary going forward. And so that kind of reallocation can happen. Uh, and between some types of jobs, it's quite fluid. Between other types of jobs, where there's a lot of specialized knowledge, it's, it's much less fluid. Like we're not, you can't just jump into nursing, even though we need tons of nurses. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's quite a bit harder. Um, but the other thing is um, related to, to, to the stimulus packages is we need to find a way to support people who are, just waiting for their markets to come back and can't find these other positions. Because partly what I was saying is people are just scared to consume right now. And that's going to push us into a more long lasting recession than just the, just the COVID crisis would suggest. We're going to reopen the economy, but a lot of people won't have jobs and a lot of people's markets won't be coming back yet. And so they won't be spending the money so that employers are going to be wanting to contract more. And that can snowball into an aggregate demand recession. And so I think I think that's a really big problem and it's an important point to raise. And I would just emphasize that the reallocation that's happening is important and to some extent can mitigate that. But then we need public policy to do the rest. Yeah. Eric, if I could, add, I just want to underscore that, you know, the, the transformation is happening. It's not just within companies. It's across the economy and across sectors. And that's a healthy thing. I mean, we, we want the economy to to transition. We should facilitate that. I was talking to, to Jeff Wilkie, head of Amazon Consumer Services, a couple of weeks ago. He said they hired 125,000 people. So there is hiring happening in parts of the economy as we become more remote, not just in our work, but in our, in our consumption. Um, one of the issues is, can we get the skill mismatch? Can we, can we get people to learn the new skills that are needed for some of those jobs? Sometimes it may be very simple. Others, as Lisa mentioned, nursing and others, there's more sophisticated uh, teaching and training needs to be done. But it would be great if we had a national platform to help with this kind of matching, identify the opportunities, because there are people having trouble hiring right now. And sometimes it's because we don't have the right set of skills. And sometimes those skills can be taught relatively quickly. So if we had a more systematic way of saying, hey, you know, learn Python or learn customer service or learn something else, and there's a whole set of jobs that would be available for you. But if we do it right, um, actually, on the other side of this, the economy is going to be more uh uh, efficient, more nimble, more productive. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that could be, it's a tragedy that what's happened, but there is a, a silver lining if it leads to people finding better matches for their capabilities on the other side. Well, I want to wrap up with a final question. It's a very big question with only about a minute or two to answer it. Uh, we, can't, we can't do real justice to it, but I think we have to put it on the table. That's a question about um, the global dimension rather than just a kind of domestic focus. And I have in mind at least two things. Um, in the language of economists or social scientists, we have a, you know, a great variety of natural experiments going on right now with respect to different policies that are confronting the pandemic, both in terms of public health and in terms of um, economic policy. Um, so I'm wondering if there's anything that you think we as Americans should be learning from what's successful elsewhere to the extent that you know about that on the economic front. But more generally, I'm also interested whether anyone has anything to say about whether there will be differential effects on developed nations as opposed to the developing world with respect to emerging from the pandemic in economic terms. Anybody want to take a crack at either of those? And we I think kind I, of made bullet answers. Yeah. yeah, okay. So my bullet answer is that we are squandering a lot of opportunity to learn from these policy changes because we are not collecting information that we know we need. Um, I thought it was really disturbing. A panel I was on last week noted that in all the school reopenings in, that had happened in Europe so far, very little information um, was collected that would allow folks to link those reopenings to subsequent cases, which just mm -hmm. seems like a first order, super basic um, grad student level type exercise to do. So just to put it out there, we're doing tons of experiments and we're not really collecting what we need. And I, I think just underscoring that we need to do that to make this efficient and effective is super important. Eric or Lisa? 
Sure. Uh, th that's a big question, but I'll be bullet and, and say, look, I think one of the interesting paradoxes is that everyone's correctly pointing out that there's going to be a pullback in international travel and trade of physical goods and services, a reduction in globalization on many of those dimensions. But I think what people are missing is I think there's going to be a surge in globalization of information work and digitization. When you go remote, you can work 10 miles away, 1,000 miles away, or 10,000 miles away. And um, that's going to put a lot of information workers in, in a global labor market. Economists talk about factor price equalization, the idea that if there's somebody uh, just as smart and productive as you elsewhere willing to do the job, um, then employers are going to look for those opportunities. And that's going to have a profound effect on people both in other countries and in the United States. All right, Lisa, we can give you the last word if you wish for it. Yeah, no, I was just going to say on the labor market side, I think the U.S. could learn a lot from other countries that do a better job of maintaining the tie between the worker and the employer when there's a temporary downturn and there's a temporary need to, to cut on costs. So, for instance, in Germany, uh, where there's a way to reduce people's workloads but still keep them attached to the employer, the CARES Act has some provisions like that, and we should be emphasizing those and um, uh, communicating those because, again, in the recovery, uh, there's going to be much more damage done to people who have just had their had their ties severed with their employers than people who are still attached to their employers, even if they do need to be retrained or something like that. Yeah. So. Terrific. Well, I want to thank our three panelists for this opening session on the economic road out of the pandemic. Um, we're going to take a short break now and reassemble with a, a second session on various humanistic and social concerns about the pandemic. Um, including concerns about the election, testing and tracing, and some other things as well. So um, thanks once again, and we'll see you all again in uh, less than 10 minutes. <laughs>